Black History Month Black Health and Wellness Program. We are so excited to have you all here with us today and thank you so thank you for joining us and we look forward to you enjoying the show. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Kevin, if you will go to the next chart, please. So I'm Kirsten White. I am the chair of the headquarters African American ERG called Macau. And I'm here. I'm going to go through the agenda with you and then I'm going to hand it over to um, to get our program kicked off. So today we're going to have a welcome from Mr. Gregory Robinson, the director of the James Webb Telescope Program. Then we'll have a message from the Houston Rockets. Um, we'll then transition into a fireside chat with um, NASA astronauts. So um, we're excited that they were able to join us for the program today and um, we look forward to that piece of the program. Um, we'll then transition into our medical professionals. We have three great individuals here with us today who are going to talk to us on a variety of topics dealing with um, mental health and stress and um, in the workplace and just in general in life and how some tips on how you can deal with that. Um, we'll, we'll round that out with a Q&A section. And so if you have questions, if you may have seen it in our kind of our, um, our housekeeping chart in the previous video, but just put your questions in the chat and then we'll, we'll have a, a moderator that will ask your questions. So if you think of something along the way, please you, utilize the chat to put your questions over there. Um, and then we'll close out today with the Associate Administrator for Diversity and Equal Opportunity, Mr. Steve Shee. Um, so with that said, I'm not going to prolong us any, prolong us. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Greg Robinson. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kirsten, and, and welcome to all for joining us uh, today, uh, certainly at the beginning of Black History Month. Uh, coincidentally, I, I received a note from my wife this morning uh, saying that black history is not just today or this month, black history is a lifetime. Uh, so I know we all live it, but uh, I think we need to take the time to appreciate it, uh, that it's a, a lifetime. Uh, as I think back to um, some of my early mentors and, and folks who influenced me directly and indirectly uh, and where we are today, um, and I just happened to be in Baltimore, uh, just drove back today, um, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where we're doing uh, commissioning uh, for mission ops for uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, I thought about all of the rich history in Baltimore uh, of people like uh, um, Garrett Morgan, Elijah McCoy, and people like that. Of course, um, we, we've all lived uh, the Katherine Johnson story and, and with her as well uh, in recent years. Um, and, and folks like Roy Clay in Silicon Valley, uh, many many giant pioneers uh, that we, we can reflect on. And, and of course, we, we can never forget our early explorers, particularly in space, uh, you know, Ed Dwight's and the Guy Bluford's through, um, um, geez, I'm drawing a blank of why I'm to do that. Uh, Fred Gregory, also a mentor of mine, Charlie Bolden and up through Mae Jameson, and there are many, many more who you will hear from today. And they're all pioneers uh, in their own right and continue to influence uh, our communities. And, and we thank them for that. And certainly you will hear a lot today about wellness, uh, black health, uh, many, many giants there going way back uh, a century. I have to remember what century I'm in. A couple of centuries ago, people like uh, Rebecca Crumpler, of course, we had, you know, Charles Drew and uh, Vivian Thomas. Um, and even recently, uh, the. I say young lady because I'm getting old, uh, the young lady that played a lead role in, in uh, uh, discovering the vaccines uh, for COVID. Uh, and I, I'll murder her first name, Kesme Kier uh, Corbett. Um, but you can look her up and get her name just right. Uh, just so many, so many giants. Um, and, and again, you will hear from many of them today. Uh, one thing I, I reflect on and then I'll hand it off uh, we often say everything we need to know we learn in kindergarten. So when the, we used to line up to go out for recess, um, that was to keep your body in motion. And that's what we should do for the rest of our lives, keep our bodies in motion. Of course, they tried to feed us very healthy meals and snacks. Um, and we continue to practice that today. It's that important. And keeping our minds uh, sharp and busy I think if we can do those things that we learned in kindergarten, we'll be okay. Uh, but 
uh, the panel here today will, will tell us a lot more about uh, what we can do and about uh, the data and what it's telling us. So I look forward to hearing the rest of uh, the panel, panelists, uh, and again, welcome and welcome to Black History Month. Uh, thank you and I'll hand it off to Candace. Welcome to the 2022 Black History Month program. Now we will have a, a special message from the Houston Rockets. Hi everyone, this is Armani Brooks from the Houston Rockets. And I'm Willie Cruz, Director of Athletic Performance for the Houston Rockets. As a professional athlete, nutrition and exercise is important for my performance. Nutrition and exercise are important for athletes because they help increase energy levels, build strong muscles, and help with overall bone health. One of my go-to healthy meals during the season is grilled chicken pasta with asparagus. And my favorite exercise to stay in shape during the season is the Versa Climber. Health should be a focus for everyone because it prevents chronic diseases and helps with our longevity, helping us to thrive in our daily lives. As we celebrate Black History Month, we hope you'll join us in putting a priority on your health and wellness. Thank you, NASA, and enjoy the event. Hi, everyone. This is I'm Candace Palacios Hong, and I am the chair of the Johnson Space Center AAERG. And we would like to thank the, um, as the AAERG collaboration team, we would like to thank the Houston Rockets for participating in this year's program. Now, up next, we are going to see a panel discussion that I have the honor to moderate with our astronauts, Victor Glover, Jeanette Epps, uh, Stephanie Wilson, and Jessica Watkins, as they discuss health and wellness in space. Um, which will then talk about their nutrition, their mental health, and as well as their physical health. I hope you enjoy. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Candace Palacios Hong. I support the Office of the Chief Financial Officer as the Space Technology Missions Director and Integrator for Johnson Space Center. And a large part of my job is bringing people together. So as the chair of the African American Employee Resource Group for Johnson, I am excited to have a panel discussion today with these four amazing astronauts. Uh, we have Jeanette Epps, Victor Glover, Stephanie Wilson and Jessica Watkins. Um, each one has such um, an incredible bio. We could spend the whole day talking about them. I encourage everyone to go to nasa.gov backslash astronauts to get more information on them. Um, but today, they are going to be talking about this year's Black History Month theme, which is about wellness. Um, coming from four different astronaut classes, uh, one just landing and three preparing for um, new missions. They are going to have a great um, unique perspective about wellness. Uh, we'll be touching on mental health, nutrition, as well as physical health. So thank you again, uh, the four of you, for joining me today about this discussion. So I'm going to start with Jessica. Um, as you prepare for SpaceX 4, how are you preparing mentally for your extended stay? Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, fear you. <laughs> that would help. Um, yes, I, it's a great question. And, you know, I think mental health and wellness um, has many parts to it. So when I when I think about how I prepare mentally, there there's a lot of different aspects to that. Um, but one of them that's really important for me is, um, are, is just investing in my relationships. Um, the people around me are really what allow me to be 
um, mentally strong and mentally healthy. And so really investing into, um, you know, pouring, pouring into other people's lives and allowing them to pour into mine um, is really what um, gives me um, energy and encouragement uh, to continue um, with training and, and on into the mission. Awesome. Um, also, what are you preparing as far as how are you changing your eating habits um, as you get ready to, to head out? Yeah, of course, nutrition is a, a super important aspect of uh, life on station. Um, and we have a huge team of people on the ground that help us keep track of that. Um, so Victor can talk about it a little bit more, but um, we have a, a program where we can record everything that we eat and all of the nutrition facts that are in each of those foods get recorded and downloaded on the ground. So um, the team can track and make sure that we're getting everything that we need to. Um, so in preparation for that, we kind of want to have the same mentality here on the ground, you know, thinking about what we consume, thinking about, you know, food as, as energy and as fuel um, so that we can enable ourselves to be physically and mentally well. Awesome. So, yeah, Victor, as someone who just landed, how did, um, how did you go ahead and prepare for that? I think the, the first and most important thing is to recognize that you need to do it and to be intentional about preparing for that aspect of the mission. It's easy to focus on the technical things and operational things, spacewalking and, and the research, uh, the many research projects that we have, but to know that you do have to prepare yourself for this major life shift where you literally turn your life experience on its head uh, is, uh, is, is time well spent. Um, I think one big thing for me was knowing that my family was going to be okay. And so I told when I got assigned, I sat my family down and, and told them what was happening and said, hey, NASA is going to spend the next two to three years preparing me for this mission. I'm going to spend that same time preparing you for this mission. And so that was a, a big part of it for me, knowing that they were okay is, is a big part of helping me to be okay. And uh, let's see, well, I'll answer more questions about food later if, if we get into that too. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so, Jeanette, what are the special exercises and routines that you do to, one, prepare for a mission, and then, two, that you do while you're um, on a mission? Well, for me right now, one of the big things that I'm learning is that I need to work every muscle, especially as I get older. So, like, recently, one of the challenges that I had was doing the 100 kettlebell swings, you know, per day at least three or four times a week. So for me, that's just a way to build muscle from head to toe and build your entire body up to strengthen you so that when you do fly, you've got the strength, the mental capacity, you've got everything going for you. So that's one of the big exercise things that I'm focusing on now, especially leading up to a flight, is getting strong completely from head to toe and making sure that I'm ready to go and I can withstand anything and I'm ready for whatever comes at me. Wow, okay, I might give myself that challenge. <laughs> but no, that's amazing. Also, um, so going into it, so Stephanie, what would, as far as preparing yourself um, for self-care, that looks a lot different um, on Earth as it does in um, space. So what is something um, you are doing to prepare yourself for self-care? Um, and then, Victor, if you could go, I know you said you talked about your family after that. And actually, self-care preparation is uh, similar. Um, what we do on Earth it can be similar to what we do in space. A lot of the work that we do leading up to the mission, the training, the preparation, preparing our families, and in order to be um, vibrant parts of the team, we have to express and uh, be good at self-care on the ground. And that translate, uh, translates also into our work on orbit, uh, being member of the team, uh, working with mission control, being a good crew member, being a good um, teammate. Also, uh, it's very helpful when uh, the uh, crew member experiences and participates and um, does uh, self-care also. And so that is something that is constant throughout all of the work that we do, the training and the mission. Yeah, great questions. And I love, you know, what, what these things are bringing up and, and how you're going to get a lot of different perspectives on it. And so I think that uh, um, intentionality, again, is a, is a big part of it. And because humans are 
you are creatures of habit. Yeah, I think it's important to have good habits. And like Stephanie said, you're not going to all of a sudden gain these new skills on orbit. In fact, that's a dangerous strategy if you're trying to wait till you're on orbit to do something. And so building good strategies on the ground, but also because, you know, I, I just went from not having flown to having flown for the first time. And so that, you know, unknown aspect of it creates this challenge. And, and, and you know, knowing that, hey, I'm going to get there and have to adjust on the fly as well. I mean, I've got the skills, the training. I've tried to do these things to take care of myself. One strategy that I took in preparing for this mission, you know, listening to people like Stephanie, who was a mentor to me and other folks who had recently returned, I knew that it was important to keep things simple. So keeping things simple allowed me to be flexible, and that allowed me to keep my stress levels low. So anything that you know, was a stressor that I could get rid of, you know, there are going to be natural stressors, but things that I could control, I tried to keep it very simple so that when I got to space and things weren't exactly like they are on Earth, and now I have to adapt to living in weightlessness and managing this new problem set, you know, that you can't effectively train for. You can't train for the integrated real-world experience of living on ISS on Earth. It's just not possible. You get little pieces of it, but then you go to space, and it's all together, all day, every day. And so keeping it simple is one important aspect, in my opinion, of, of having uh, a, an effective strategy for coping with stresses and health and well-being on ISS. And like I said, we're creatures of habit. So the other thing is, too, is you know, thinking about mathematics and how you add up the area under a curve, integrals, right? It's essentially adding up little bits along the way. And so instead of thinking about these sweeping changes, it's January and people are setting New Year's resolutions. But really, it's about small things that you can maintain forever, drinking more water, going to bed a little bit earlier and getting more sleep, things like that, as opposed to this new workout regime, you know, having these small but consistent things that we can maintain, again, are, are an important part of a of good health and wellness strategy. Awesome. And so with that said, as you said, when, you know, when you're um, in orbit, you're with a different group of people, right? You're not always, um, you know, it's not always the same crew each time. So how about, what is it like to um, be with different individuals where you're adapting to different personalities and how important is everybody's, um, whether it's humor or, you know, um, understanding if you said if things are changing, how do you adapt to those different personalities in a very unique setting? Sure, I'll start. And that um, it is important to be adaptable, and uh, that is also a skill uh, that we look for when we select classes. We look for individuals who can be flexible and can be adaptable, can function as uh, leaders and followers. And so that general theme uh, carries through. Uh, as we work with uh, individuals in our office and also with other organizations. And then when we come to uh, being part of a, of a particular crew, um, and uh, every crew is different, and so even as individuals, so we may have um, certain characteristics or certain things that we like, different uh, parts of our personalities may come out as we're with different, uh, uh, different uh, crews or different, um, we're able to, I, I guess I should say, um, focus and or stress different aspects of our personalities. And so we'll have a chance to, as we have different roles, function uh, in different ways, doing different activities, but also um, having a chance to uh, have some downtime, share stories, uh, have some humor. Uh, that's also part of the uh, off time or the personal time that we're able to, to share. And so those things, um, we do have a chance to experience those things, and it is important to be as flexible as possible and to know that um, one's role may change or uh, different aspects of uh, personality uh, may change with different crew members uh, and as being part of different crews. Well, I haven't flown, but um, I can add just from the experience of doing all these analog missions, and one of the things um, that, you know, either your natural um, personality comes out, especially doing um, a nose class, that's the National Outdoor Leadership, living underwater or living in a cave. And all of these analog missions, you end up living with people who you don't normally spend time with. And you can spend a lot of time doing, like we talked about, the self-care, the nutrition, but also getting to know your teammates and doing team care as well. So I do think that the aspect of living together can, we can kind of get a little bit of taste of that 
here on Earth through all of the analog missions that we have. And even being deployed like with the military or in other places, you become very self-aware and you become more flexible, adaptable, and understanding of other people so that when you do live with different people, you can be a little bit more understanding, a lot more understanding actually, and even more flexible. Yeah, I, I, I certainly echo what these guys have said and would, would just add that, you know, I think one of the unique things, one of the coolest parts about what we do on ISS is that we, we have to both live and work together and live slash play and work together, right? And so in, in many other environments, um, aside from the analog is a great, great example, but um, in a lot of work environments, you know, you, we have to be adaptable and flexible professionally. Um, and that's certainly true on board, but there's this added aspect of being flexible and adaptable in, um, you know, kind of more of the, the living side of things, the, the in-between spaces and, and the everyday activities. Um, and so I think that's where spending time together, really fully understanding each other, both as uh, colleagues, but also as friends and, and as, uh, um, you know, uh, peers is what really makes ISS uh, super fun. Uh, just honestly, seeing these three ladies' faces, I mean, I would love, the four of us, I think, would make a great crew. I would love to fly with them, you know, and it just, like like Stephanie said, we put a lot of effort into picking people that, that exhibit adaptability and flexibility professionally. Uh, and when you get to this office, you know, someone told me early on, I don't care what you're used to, I care what you can adapt to. I think that is a huge part of being successful in this job is being able to adapt. But that's a hard thing to exercise, right? On Earth, we generally try to, you know, try to uh, prioritize convenience and efficiency. And and when you get to space, you know, you're you're not always going to be in in a in a situation where that is the priority. You're going to have to do things a certain way, and it's going to really require you to be adaptable. And so, in in trying to weave together a team that can accomplish the mission, this really complex mission of of working and living on the International Space Station, we try to put the groups together on the ground so that they can get used to each other. But with the nature of things now, the, the, the beginnings of this commercial crew program, but still flying folks on Russian spacecraft, and now we're adding in these uh, non-professional astronauts or space flight participants and movie stars, you've just got this interesting amalgamation of people and personalities that I think it's really going to be incumbent on us to think about having to do real-time uh, bonding of a crew when you don't have time training on the ground. And so, and, and so, you know, we've talked about how to, how we do it on, on orbit, how we do, you know, try to do it on, on the ground, like Knowles and, and Nemo, the underwater and caves uh, expeditions. One of the reasons it's so important though, there's a pragmatic side to, to knowing your crew and, and having an understanding of them. It's when things really uh, are going normally, nominally, as NASA likes to say it, when things are nominal, you could take anybody from our office, put them together, and that mission's going to be fine. But when alarms start going off or when the schedule gets really crammed and you got to work through weekend after weekend after weekend, that's when it's important to, to really have that, that tight bond. You can really help each other out. And when you know somebody well, you can notice when, they're, when something has changed. You know, Ike always smiles. That's my nickname, Ike. You know, hey, Ike is always smiling, and for this, this weekend, he hasn't smiled once. You know, something's wrong. Ike is always eating. He hasn't eaten a bite today. Something is really wrong if I'm not eating. So it's also important to know your crewmates so that you know when to check on them, because one of us or, or more of us are usually or something called a crew medical officer, and that is a very important part of it is the, the mental health and well-being aspect of healthcare as well. What is it like when you're the only woman and a woman of color um, in that room, and how does that um, affect you, you know, mentally in that space? And and there will be times when you'll be in orbit and you will be the only woman and you may be the only woman of color. Um, how do you prepare for that and, and kind of keep take your your space in those environments? Being in these advanced graduate programs, we're constantly the only one. But I don't think that. Um, I ever really focused on being the only one. Like in graduate school, I focused on, I'm a part of the team, we're in the rotorcraft group and we're working on different projects, but we're working on one system. And so for me, it was never really a, a, a thing that I would focus on. So I always like to tell little girls, you know, don't focus on being the only one in there, but what are you going to do? How are you going to contribute? How are you going to make your team know that you're invaluable? that you're, you can be a go-to person to help the crewmates, help anyone if they need it, and get your job done as well. So being a part of the crew, 
rather than being the black female on the crew is what I focused on. And that's what I always focus on. And all of my um, jobs when I was on the team was the only, I could have been the only American too. So I think um, as females, you know, sometimes we do have a tendency to focus on that, but I think, and especially in a crew, like going to space, going to the moon, even being deployed in different places, um, focusing on the crew, being a member of the crew, how you're gonna contribute, how you're gonna make sure that your crew know that you're invaluable and that you're there for that. Jeanette uh, speaks very good words and my experience is uh, very similar. Uh, as a child of the 60s and uh, going to being in college in the 80s, uh, there were very few women and people of color, particularly in the STEM fields. And uh, I have seen that grow over time. And uh, it's great now that there are more women and more people of color in the technical fields. Uh, we're not uh, having to focus on being uh, the only one. And um, for the crews that I've been a part of, uh, there have been other women, and so that has been uh, nice to share that experience as well. And I think it is important, as Jeanette says, to uh, focus on being a good team member. Whatever that means for a particular team, focus on uh, the strengths that, uh, as an individual, uh, you bring to the team and uh, do your best to um, ensure the success of the team. You know, and that can look different uh, for different uh, teams. But um, it's, it's more important to focus on the role and to be a contributing member of the team. You know, I, I think it really is, is a, a decision that we make individually on, on how you're going to perceive the, the situation. Um, it's, it, you know, it's difficult to, to fully ignore that fact, but you can choose to either see that as kind of a burden um, you know, burden of representation, or you can see it as an opportunity, as these guys um, have, have, have outlined for us, where we have the opportunity to uh, show what we're capable of as individuals, um, and, and then in, in doing so, also pave the way for people that are coming behind us so that they are not the first or the only. Um, and so the, the opportunity to, to lay that foundation and continue into that future um, I think is, is the best way to look at it. And I just want to say that that can create a challenging balancing act for you to navigate. And these three ladies, while it may, you know, on the outside, they have done it with grace. And, and again, you know, they're mentors to me. Uh, even, even Jessica, who hasn't been here as long as I have, I've learned things from her as well. And watching them navigate that has, has truly been uh, a, a, a personal and professionally enlightening thing. So, uh, they have also managed to do that with grace and poise and insight. And so it is not, it's not as easy as they make it look, but uh, it, it is a challenge and they have done it with uh, amazing poise. So, and just to kind of going into and uh, feeding on what you made, said was that, you know, there are instances where you guys are the first, you had, you were the first uh, to do it. And what is your hope for, you know, the, what's coming next, who's behind you? And what are you hoping that they see and they do um, as far as as they continue in their journeys? Because being the first isn't always, you know, it, it, there's there's challenges in that uh, when you don't have a blueprint in front of you. So I commend all of you because, you know, having a, not having someone to say this is how you're going to do it, this is how it's going to feel, and what you're going to experience, um, there's a challenge in its own. So what are your hopes for those that are coming behind you? Yeah, I certainly um, agree that, you know, I think, Ultimately, the goal is for there to not be firsts in the near future, right? For there to or to limit the number of firsts. We get to a point where, um, you know, having women, women of color, people of color, um, you know, fill in the blank of, of whatever first it is that that is no longer a a big deal because it's something that that we do on a regular basis. That diversity is something that we see all the time. I think that's the the end goal. Um, and so, to the extent that we can be a part of helping us get there, um, you know, that's, that's, we're grateful for that opportunity to be able to step in and, um, you know, uh, be the first so that later on uh, the next person doesn't, doesn't have to be the first. I also want to just add that it's a lovely thing to see this because 
for my nieces who are like watching everything that I do. To them, this is like normal. This is what girls do. This is how the group looks. This is how people participate where everybody, doesn't matter race, you know, nothing matters, gender, we're all included and we're all doing this together. So it'll be like a normal thing. Oh yeah, that's just what we do. That's how we do it. <laughs> so it'll be a nice thing where we do have like this whole notion of, hey, you're the first. Does that mean that we couldn't do it before? Or, you know, why is it that we're the first now? So um, getting rid of that whole notion is going to be important for my nieces in particular. And I like all of those ideas um, and being able to pave the way for the future. And if we think about it in particular for space flight, we, um, we are still flying first in many areas. And uh, I, if you draw the circle correctly, all of our colleagues are first. And, and uh, or he or she may be first in a neighborhood, a high school, an area, a particular area of a state. Um, particular um, uh, portion of the military test pilot school or particular area, particular uh, uh, part of engineering. So we are all first. And so everybody um, uh, can be, uh, we can support everybody in that, uh, in that endeavor and in that effort and then look to uh, unifying that so that we uh, as an organization are being sure to lay the foundation and uh, set the framework so that uh, our future can continue and we can continue to bring more people into the fold. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the, the big idea that pops into my head when you say, what do I think about for future generations, you know, based on the work that we've been able to be a part of, this awesome legacy is that, that this isn't what defines us, you know, it's a challenge to, to not be defined by this, you know, like Stephanie was saying, and actually everybody's touched on this, but, you know, there's lots of different firsts. And so uh, it's easy. The, the PAO wants to label this. They want to put a label on it. And, you know, I just wanted to go up there and be an astronaut, contribute, be a flight engineer, board engineer, and, and do my part. And to me, I think it's, it'll, it'll really be telling when, like I think Jessica mentioned too, when you go up there and, and, and no one has to say, talk about it being a first, because you know, as Stephanie said, you dice it the right way and you can say a first about everything. But when it just becomes normal, this is the way we do business. And this business is done by a group of people that looks like America or humanity at large. That to me is, a, is really something to celebrate, you know? So I'm happy that we have this, you know, group of people that have these firsts after their names, but I think all of us unanimously want to hurry up and get to the next one. First, one of the most important things, at least for me, I'm just going to talk for myself. For me, people wanted to talk about first, but when I was up there working, I was like, don't be the last, don't be the last. Like, I don't want to put any, I don't want anybody walking away from this going, man, that guy, I don't want anybody else looking like him going because of what he did. So I wanted to go up there and then get back and have nobody remember anything out of, out of the ordinary. If I went up there and played my role and came back and was not exceptional in a good or bad way, just I did my job, then, you know, the next person comes in with a clean slate or as much of a clean slate as possible. So when that's not notable, to me, that'll actually be progress. That's awesome. No, I appreciate uh, your, your candor and your honesty. And, and Jenna, I have two nieces and, um, Yes, I think I think they've seen me, um, and it's changed maybe their dynamic of how they view um, a girl <laughs> and working and finding all those things. So I, I completely relate. So um, seeing their brains change their thought process, and they're just like, "Oh no, my auntie, she works at NASA, and she's you know she's you know they think they think they think I'm an astronaut. You know, I have to tell them that's not me. But yeah, I think also just just changing those perspectives, even if it's in, in our own community, in our own families, that that's a good starting point. Um, what I did want to talk about, um, what, what we've seen um, uniquely in these last couple of years is um, a more attention towards social injustices that we are seeing in the United States. Um, and a lot of people are having a difficulty time coping with that. Um, your situations are a bit unique, because I know with Victor, um, you, know, you were in orbit um, at the time when the death of George Floyd was um, being widely publicized all over the news and being reported, how do you cope with those situations when you can't be with 
you know, physically be with your loved ones during that time, um, whether it's you're in training or you're preparing and you're just not surrounded by your family and those that you care about, how do you cope um, when you see those types of images um, in, the, in those different scenarios? Yeah, Candice, this is a this is a deep rabbit hole for me. Um, I'll try to be brief. I think one I'll, I'll give you one really pragmatic thing that I did a lot of, and that's writing. Writing helped me sort out feelings, put them out there, uh, and in a controlled fashion. So I, I wrote, I journaled, I wrote it in Word documents on my phone. And so I just put things on paper and it helped me sort out things. And, and knowing I was going to be in a role where people were going to ask me questions and put a microphone and a camera in my face, it helped me collect my thoughts and, and again, prioritize them and, 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 and put them uh, in a way that I could communicate those messages effectively. But also in the process of doing that, I had to also metabolize the emotions that came with it. You know, and you, it's interesting, you, you referenced George Floyd and the world was thinking, I mean, I'm still amazed. I, I watched a protest that was uh, folks in Germany chanting in English, George Floyd. And that was, it was an, an, an amazing and interesting and, and also unsettling time in our country and all around the world. But the, uh, a few names that really resonate with me are Ayanna Jones, a young lady who was killed uh, during the filming of a, a police officer show. She was seven, and my oldest daughter was seven at the time. And then Ahmaud Arbery, 25-year-old young man out, you know, getting exercise, jogging around his neighborhood, and, and he was gunned down. Uh, and, and, and I jog around my neighborhood. And so those two cases really resonated with me. Uh, and before my launch, uh, I spent a lot of time writing and thinking, but also sharing it. I mean, actually, these three ladies here that are a part of this panel, I shared some of my thoughts and asked them questions. And so they were a part of my team. You know, one of the things I talk about in this pandemic, these tough times, it really will help you figure out who your friends are. That's one of the benefits, one of the silver linings uh, of these uh, tumultuous times is it'll help you figure out who your friends are. And so they helped me knowing the, per the, the personal connection, but the professional responsibility that comes with this position. And so having friends, uh, uh, really helped. That that was the biggest one. Writing and then talking to to folks like uh, the rest of this panel was a huge help for me. Just to be quick, um, I you know my personality is such that you know when I see injustices like that, I will always want to champion something. But I do believe that being in our position and you know knowing NASA, NASA has a lot of compassion as well. Um, for, you know, things like this when they do happen. And so it was very difficult um, to try to understand why these things were happening and what was going on. And like Victor, um, for me, writing was huge. But also, you know, having a conversation with people like Victor, Stephanie, Jessica, and just having a pure, raw conversation about how you're feeling and getting it out. And it's not really venting, but just discussing, just to understand and try to wrap your brain around what's happening. Having that talk with people you love and people who understand and care about you, and even people who don't, just having an honest conversation really does a lot for my, my soul. And in and, and situations like this where you want to champion the cause, you want to shout at the rooftops, you want to go talk to other people on, you know, wherever you can, you know, if you can influence things. But, um, you know, situations like that, um, I think having a panel of people like this and having a, a real conversation um, really helped. And NASA had a lot of great conversations after events took place. And that, that really, it really touched my heart to see how much NASA was allowing to happen and how much they championed this, this whole um, social injustice thing that was happening at the time. So. Yeah, I, I was essentially going to say the same thing as Jeanette. I think for me what was really and continues to be um, encouraging in this time is having those honest conversations with both with people, you know, very close to me, very, you know, in my inner circle, um, but also, you know, engaging others in conversation that maybe we wouldn't have had that conversation with um, or certainly not on that topic. Um, and so I think just seeing that, seeing people come together, seeing people come together to protest or um, 
you know, together in that cause and be willing to have those conversations and move forward together. Um, that has been really encouraging for me, um, kind of as, as a silver lining for, you know, in this, this time of social injustice. You know, absolutely. I, I agree. NASA has been extremely supportive during this time. Um, not a lot of people can say that um, as from, you know, places where they work. And so that, that has been something that I think we've all agreed that, that they did a great job at least um, encouraging honest conversations. And I think you all kind of hit on that is it's having an honest conversation with people um, around you. Um, and sometimes that's not always, you know, your family or your friends, but it's just your coworkers and, and being in a different environment. It's important to be able to feel like you can have an honest conversation with people you're interacting with. Um, I agree. I'm Stephanie, sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I'm um, not sure I have too much to add except to echo uh, the things that have been said, really important to uh, have a period of inner reflection and try to, um, that was helpful to me, just to really try to sort through things that were happening and get an understanding of um, how I felt about it and then having that discussion with others uh, close to me. Thank you guys so much. Um... It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. I'm a huge fan of all of you. So this is, you know, this has been really amazing. And thank you again for your time. So all right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, it was a true honor and pleasure to sit down and have a very open and candid conversation with all four of them. Uh, but now I will be handing it over to Portia Keys um, as she will take it on for the next section of today's event. Just as a reminder, uh, please add any of your questions into the chat box and we will have a Q&A session later so um, we can get those answered as well. All right, thank you, Candice, and hi, everyone. Uh, just wanted to say that was very impressive, just makes me feel really proud to be part of the community, especially during this month here at NASA. So um, welcome, everyone. My name is Portia Keyes, and I'm a contracting officer in the Office of Procurement located here at Johnson Space Center. And for our next part of the program, we'll be hearing from three NASA medical professionals on this important topic of Black health and wellness. And so each of our guests will provide presentations of approximately 10 minutes in length after which we'll have a 15-minute Q&A session with our doctors, as well as our NASA astronaut, Victor Glover. Um, kicking off this section will be Dr. Umgesha, the agency occupational health uh, physician for the Office of the Chief and Health and Medical Officer uh, right here at NASA. She is a board-certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and completed her residency at Tulane University. Uh, so Dr. Umgesha is going to educate us on social determinants and African-American health. So you can hear me, um, and I probably will turn off my video because I said that helps with the bandwidth, just to let you know. But I will be talking about social determinants in African American health, um, and I'm here in support of the Office of the Chief Health and Medical Officer. Next slide, please. Did you know that research suggests that 80% of what makes up a person's health is actually determined by things happening outside of hospitals and the healthcare system? Social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. They include factors like socioeconomic status, education, neighborhood and physical environment, employment, social support networks, and discrimination, as well as access to health care. Noted on the graphic of the person are estimates of the relative contribution of each of these factors to health. Socioeconomic factors and health behaviors, such as smoking, diet, and exercise, are the primary drivers of health outcomes. And these socioeconomic factors actually play a large role in creating these health behaviors. For example, children born to parents who have not completed high school are more likely to live in an environment that poses barriers to health, such as lack of safety, exposed garbage, and substandard housing. They are also less likely to have access to sidewalks, parks or playgrounds, rec centers, or a library. Further, evidence shows that stress negatively affects health across the lifespan and that environmental factors may have multi-generational impacts. Learning about and discussing these social determinants of health 
is not only important for understanding how to improve overall health, but also for reducing health disparities that are often rooted in social and economic disadvantages. Now let me give you a few specific examples. Next slide, please. There are about 40 million non-Hispanic black people in the United States. This equates to 13% of the total population. The 1960s was a turning point for African Americans with the March on Washington, Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, the Civil Rights Act of 64 prohibiting discrimination, the Voting Rights Acts of 65 removing some discriminatory voting practices, and the Civil Rights Act of 68, outlawing housing discrimination. Since that time, African Americans have made many social gains. According to the Economic Policy Institute, in 2019, more than 90% of African Americans aged 25 to 29 graduated from high school. In the 60s, it was only about 50%. Compared to the 60s, black Americans are now twice as likely to have a college degree, but this still equates to half as many as whites. This progress in educational attainment of African Americans has been accompanied by significant absolute improvement in wages, incomes, wealth, and health since 1968. But black workers still only make 82 cents on every dollar earned by white workers and are two and a half times as likely to be in poverty. The median white family has almost, as, almost 10 times as much wealth as the median black family. Next slide, please. With respect to home ownership, unemployment, and incarceration, the situation for black Americans has either failed to improve relative to whites or has worsened. In 2019, the black unemployment rate was 6.1%, roughly twice that of whites. In 2015, the black home ownership rate was just over 40% virtually unchanged since 1968 and trailing a full 30 percentage points behind the white home ownership rate. And the share of African Americans in prison or jail has almost tripled since 1968 and 2016 and is currently more than six times the white incarceration rate. The impact of incarceration on the family is devastating. One of every 15 black children has an incarcerated parent compared to one of every 110 white children. This graphic demonstrates that certain social factors also affect African Americans at younger ages. Unemployment, living in poverty, not owning a home, cost prohibitive effects of trying to see a doctor, smoking, inactive lifestyle, or obesity. And in terms of mental health, a white paper from Cigna noted that African Americans are 20% more likely to report psychological distress and 50% less likely to receive counseling or mental health treatment due to underlying socioeconomic factors. And this data was from before COVID. Next slide. COVID-19 disproportionately impacted black Americans who continue to be more likely to be infected and more likely to die from COVID-19 than white Americans. Again, due to social determinants, such as the use of public transportation, having more frontline jobs, living in more crowded housing, et cetera. We also know that households with lower levels of wealth and historically lower wage jobs have fewer resources available to temper the adverse economic impacts of COVID. One study from Michigan showed that 26% of black respondents said that the pandemic made it harder for them to pay important bills, like their mortgage, versus 10% of white respondents. When labor markets go through rough patches, black workers are more likely to lose their jobs first even accounting for years of work experience and skill level. Black workers also remain consistently underrepresented among recent unemployment insurance claims, due in part to being paid lower wages or having unstable jobs that are not eligible for unemployment insurance. The quality of and type of housing affects health. Asthma and asthma deaths, which disproportionately affects African Americans, is related to poor housing. Increased cardiovascular disease has been correlated with segregated housing. People need access to healthy foods. Black neighborhoods have significantly fewer supermarkets than white ones. Several studies also document that the food available is less fresh and of lower quality. In contrast, alcohol outlets are much more numerous in black neighborhoods. Location impacts health. 
black people are significantly more likely to reside near sources of air pollution and a greater distance from air quality monitoring sites. African Americans are more likely to live in a neighborhood in close proximity to a Superfund toxic waste site. Exposure to violence is also a major determinant of health outcomes. It is a major cause of injury, disability, and premature death. There is a very significant lifelong inequity in exposure to violence for black versus white Americans. Black male adolescents are six times more likely than whites to die of homicide, primarily through firearms. These young black males are four times more likely to die from a gunshot than their white peers. The fact that social determinants affect all aspects of life has also been unmasked by the killing of George Floyd and multiple other black Americans. Healthy People 2020 states that discrimination is a key issue in the social and community context of social determinants of health. Discrimination, which includes racism, can lead to chronic and toxic stress. You can understand how these social differences lead to differences in health. Next slide, please. A CDC analysis shows that younger African Americans are living with or dying of many conditions typically found in white Americans at older ages. The differences show up in African Americans as young as in their 20s for both diseases and causes of death. African Americans aged 35 to 64 years are 50% more likely to have high blood pressure than whites. When diseases start early, they can lead to death earlier. Chronic diseases and some of their risk factors may, not, may be silent or not diagnosed during these early years. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for most Americans, but African Americans aged 18 to 49 are nearly twice as likely to die at this earlier age from heart disease than whites. Individuals with two or more risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, current smoking, physical inactivity, and obesity are at higher risk for stroke and heart disease. The prevalence of two or more of these factors is not only higher in African Americans, but is present at younger ages than in white Americans. Next slide, please. And in general, for all causes among black Americans aged 18 to 64, the data showed that they are at higher risk of early death than white Americans. The director of the CDC's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity was quoted as saying that these findings are generally consistent with previous reports that use the term weathering, which suggests that blacks experience premature aging and earlier health decline than whites, and that this decline in health accumulates across the entire lifespan and potentially across generations. This happens as a consequence of psychosocial, economic, and environmental stress. Poverty, low education, unemployment, violence, insecurity, and environmental exposures contribute to poor health outcomes. These factors affect black families at multiple levels. Low access to healthy foods, inadequate access to preventive health care, exposure to violence, distrust of the justice and police system, unhealthy behaviors, substance abuse, and stress. A greater proportion of black children are born and live in the social, environmental, and cultural milieu. Thus, they would grow and develop differently, socially, psychologically, and health-wise throughout their lifespan. However, this resultant catastrophe of disparities is not the whole story of black health. It is also important to emphasize that African Americans have been called upon to muster extraordinary strength of mind and body for the sake of psychological and physical survival. Instances of survival and health among blacks under extraordinarily adverse circumstances represent the essence of resilience. To overlook this truth is to miss an opportunity to better understand not only black resilience, but resilience as a universal human phenomenon, the science that underlies it, and how mechanisms that preserve health in the face of adversity may help end health disparities and promote health equity. Next slide, please. When it comes to the overall health of black Americans, there is some good news. The overall death rate for black people over 65 years of age in the U.S. has declined about 25% in recent years. African American health is slowly improving, and many of the disparities we see in the chronic diseases are largely preventable. 
Through the study of these social determinants, we are learning how to tailor interventions to more strongly impact black American health. To continue to prove, improve African American health, we need to address these social determinants of health and focus on health in non-health sectors, such as faith and community organizations, education, business, transportation, housing, to create social and economic conditions that promote health starting in childhood with safe neighborhoods, healthy food environments, opportunities for increased physical activity, et cetera. Improving community resources and investing in black communities to, to improve access to public safety, quality foods, public recreation, and medical care could also help further diminish, diminish these disparities. Excuse me. <coughs> For this reason, it is important to highlight the role of these social determinants to inspire dialogue, to encourage further research, and to develop strategies to address them and their effect on health. As the lead author of the 2017 CDC study on the overall health of African Americans said, where we live determines our health. It determines our quality of housing, the schools we attend, and our employment opportunities. Individual behaviors are important, but one challenge we face is that we have to invest in the places where people live. Next slide, please. And that's my talk. So I'll go ahead and um, go on mute and stop my video. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Mgashoff. It's very informative. Um, some of the statistics were painful. But I'd be interested to hear about um, some of the solutions perhaps in our questions and answers section. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Four, uh, who's currently the medical director of the NASA Headquarters Health Unit. And she's a wellness advocate with over 25 years of experience in occupational medicine, was previously the medical director for the Department of Affairs' Occupational Health Center. Uh, today, she's going to educate us on chronic stress and immunity. Welcome, Dr. Four. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Dr. Andrea Four, and I'm the medical director of the NASA Headquarters Health Unit. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone uh, for this invitation, and I am honored to be here. And while it's important to recognize these health disparities, it's equally important to acknowledge our individual role in moving forward towards health equity. I thought it would be worthwhile to spend some time thinking about how chronic stress affects us and how we can change that and how we can thrive. Next slide, please. So take care of yourself and you take care of the entire community. Next slide, please. So the road to healing, you know, as we think about healing, some questions to ask yourself are, am I eating well? Am I exercising? What about hydration? How's my sleep? Each one of these factors will impact healing and they work synergistically in improving overall health and well being. So you have this foundation of health, but you know it's built on enhancing your immune function and making sure you have good white blood cell counts and good respiratory function and good lymphatic function. So this is the foundation of health and we have to pay attention to each one of these components. Next slide, please. Dr. Sophia will talk about mental resilience a bit later, but first I wanted to point out how our bodies function as a unit. Everything is connected. So you can't really separate the mind and the body. Some key points to take away from this are that mind and emotions have a critical impact on immune function. And immune performance is depressed by chronic stress. The most common cause of low immune function is nutrient deficiency. 70% of your immune system is in your gut. So remember that nutrition is key. 70% of your immune function is in your gut. As you can kind of see from the diagram here, we have a robust immune system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please.
The body has several lines of defense, and that's a good thing. For starters, the macrophages and other innate immune cells are really our first line of defense in getting rid of bacteria and damaged cells. But we also have adaptive immunity, where certain cells are primed, trained, and capable of remembering the intruders. This is where vaccines come into play, and they help us to promptly recognize a foreign attack from pathogens such as bacteria or viruses. Now, our B cells make antibodies and sort of lock onto foreign cell surfaces, which marks them for destruction. They sort of handcuff the intruder. And finally, helper T cells both assist the B cells as they produce antibodies and summon killer T cells to the scene of the crime. B cells directly attack and destroy other cells that they're capable of recognizing. So this is a multi-layered defense mechanism. Next slide, please. The important thing to remember here is that the immune system is made of a variety of different cells that have unique functions and that need your support and attention. Next slide, please. Chronic stress depletes us in a myriad of ways and is insidious in the way that it exacerbates underlying illnesses. In fact, studies have shown that chronic stress raises catecholamine and suppressor T cell levels, which leads to suppression of the immune system. A 2020 survey done by the American Psychological Association shows that among people of color, more than two in five or 44% report that discrimination is a significant source of stress in their life. In fact, 48% of black Americans reported discrimination as a stressor. So that when we look at the effect that this has on our bodies, it's truly eye-opening. Now in one sense, cortisol gives you the energy you need to start the day, but when we're under chronic stress, we have chronically elevated levels of adrenaline and cortisol, our white blood cell formation and function is inhibited. And this is what we use to fight off illnesses. You know, chronic stress leads to blood sugar problems, fat accumulation, compromised immune function, bone loss, and memory loss, among other factors. Next slide, please. So there's a fine line. There's a fine line here because in short spurts, stress hormones like cortisol can limit inflammation. But over time, increased cortisol levels lead to increased inflammation throughout the body. And this can lead to lymphocyte depletion, increased risk of infection, and even chronic diseases like diabetes. Uh, what we have here is a recent article that essentially um, points to the link between chronic stress and inflammation and, and being at increased risk for viruses as a result of this. Next slide, please. A poor diet can alter immune responses, so we need to consistently make the effort to give our bodies the raw materials it needs and it requires to heal and to thrive. So nutrients support the immune system by working as antioxidants to protect healthy cells. They support the growth and the activity of immune cells, and they also help in the production of antibodies. Next slide, please. Not only does vitamin D play a vital role in immune function, but most of us are probably not getting enough vitamin D. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey looked at the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency as defined by a level less than or equal to 20 nanograms per milliliter. And it was discovered that 41.6% of people are deficient in vitamin D. The highest rate was seen in blacks at 82.1%. And if you'll notice, you need good liver and kidney function to make increasingly potent forms of vitamin D. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in addition to promoting calcium resorption, which you're probably all familiar with, the evidence shows that vitamin D plays a role in the regulation of T cells, B cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and more. 
And this means that there are vitamin D receptors in activated human immune system cells. The level should be a minimum of 20 nanograms per milliliter, but ideally 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, according to the Endocrine Society. Next slide, please. This is a recent article that comes out of the Journal of Internal and Emergency Medicine. And what it shows is that vitamin D deficiency is associated with higher risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 severity. Next slide, please. These are the building blocks for a healthy immune system. So now here's your part. For your homework, I'm going to ask you to check your grocery cards and be intentional about that. You'll notice that this is real food. I want to challenge you to add at least two of these to every meal for the next two weeks and see if you notice a difference, because I believe that you will. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I feel that we have a unique opportunity to re-examine our lives and decide the best way forward for ourselves and our communities. The potential long-term consequences of persistent stress and trauma are particularly serious for our children. This pandemic has made it that much worse, but we can act now. We're stronger together and we can shape a future that welcomes supports and celebrates the best versions of ourselves. And I'll leave you with a quote from Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Thank you and be well. Thank you so much, Dr. For our excellent presentation. Again, a reminder to all our participants, if you have any questions for um, the presentations, our panelists, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll uh, get to some Q&A after our last presentation. And so for this third and final presentation, we'll have Dr. Sills Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a licensed professional counselor who is certified nationally and is also a counselor educator. Uh, she currently serves as an assistant professor for the School of Behavioral Science at Liberty University, and Dr. Taylor is also a proud veteran who served in the Navy. And so today, Dr. Taylor will educate us on mental health wellness in the African American community. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Much. And so, um, I, I, I'm sorry to do this, y'all, but I have to say hi to my parents in Philadelphia. I think they had a hard time getting going. I was like, I'm going to be on NASA TV, so I have to say hi to my parents. I'm sorry. <laughs> So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, go to the next slide, is I just want to look at some stats. Um, earlier, um, Dr. Olga um, talked about this, that when you look at African-Americans, um, we're 13.4% of the U.S. population. But then um, of the U.S. population, 16% uh, have reported um, mental illness over the past year. So that's 7 million people. And when you look at it, it's the combined populations of Chicago, Houston, and Philadelphia put together of people who reported um, some form of mental illness. Go to the next slide, please. Now, these are some of the stats um, that came from a study that was done by SAMHSA um, in 2018. And these statistics um, are, are really looking at overall mental wellness um, for Black Americans. And so, um, these were coming from like a self-report. So more than likely, um, African-Americans are to feel a sadness or hopelessness and worthlessness when compared to um, white Americans. 16% um, of African-Americans um, have reported some form of mental illness. And when it re makes reference to serious mental illness, um, some of the diagnoses are schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and then anxiety. And so those are some of the main um, areas that people kind of report. And then also what falls under mental health is substance abuse. And so in terms of binge drinking, smoking cigarettes, the use of illicit drugs and pain, um, pain medication um, abuse, um, that was found to be very high in the African-American community as well. And so what's interesting too, is that suicide um, is up in the African-American community. Some of the stats reported 
is that suicide thoughts and plans and attempts were also arising among African-American young adults, while still lower than overall U.S. population um, uh, ages 18 to 25, 9 percent, which is 439,000 approximately of African-Americans 18 years or older, has serious thoughts of suicide. Um, you can go to the next slide. So when you look at African-Americans' mental health and stigma, it's really making reference to the fact that many are, are not um, seeking assistance with mental health issues. So many African-Americans hold negative beliefs regarding uh, psychological openness, the willingness to talk about mental health issues, and then help-seeking behaviors, the willingness to go out and actually seek uh, mental health. There's this perceived stigma, and some of the reasons um, that uh, that mental this health mental health stigma comes into place is because I guess within the African American community, us even talking about um, mental mental wellness, like going out and seeking these um, assistance with mental health, um, is seen as almost as a luxury. And so this study was conducted. It's a study on African American men and women's attitudes towards mental illness and perceptions of stigma. And the primary aim of the study was to examine African-American men and women's um, beliefs and attitudes. And so it was a self-reported study. And then some of the outcomes were um, that when they found that people were asked about whether or not they would seek, um, you know, seek help, it was, a, again, a repeat that less than 2% of, of psychological association members uh, for for the American Psychological Association, we're African American, and so that it's this thought that there's not a lot of culturally competent um, mental health um, workers out there. And so, if you go to the next slide, please. Many African Americans are overrepresented in jails and prisons, and then. When you look at um, African Americans as only being 13% of the U.S. population, but nearly 40% of those that are in prison, um, it makes sense. When you look at the numbers, actually, are um, 100,000 um, black males are incarcerated, and so some of the um, reasons that uh, we aren't even accessing uh, mental health is that there's a lack of insurance or being underinsured. Um, versus looking at white Americans. And then also um, when we talk about um, the stigma associated with seeking uh, mental health services is there's a trust, a, a general distrust of um, the healthcare system, a lack of providers um, in our communities that can offer um, competent care, at least that's the perception. And so uh, when we look at like a historically that there's been a dehumanization of African Americans and a lot of oppression, uh, particularly when you talk about um, some of the things that have been happening in the last several years. You can go to the next slide. So what has come out of a lot of um, this need for African Americans to receive mental health is there are so many organizations that have created resources simply to treat African Americans. And so I just wanted to share um, some of the resources with you. Now, if you go to the next slide, I want to describe some of these um, resources as well. Um, this information um, came from NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And what they do is they put resources out so that persons can go and seek, um, you know, seek help. These various organizations um, have created space, particularly for African Americans. And so one of the organizations is the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, BEAM. And so what they do is they help people to get access to services. And so you can contact BEAM. And what BEAM will do is they will um, help in terms of actually locating services in your area. Another organization is Black Men Heal. And so what they are trying to do is basically target mental health um, services towards African-American men and finding um, low-cost or no-cost mental health resources in your area. The Black Mental Health Alliance, it helps you to find a Black therapist. Black Mental Wellness, another database that will kind of help you find um, information really about mental illness. 
I think one of the biggest, um, just adding this in there, one of the biggest misnomers that I've that I've heard as an African American is that, oh, that's other people's stuff. Um, that a lot of the um, mental illnesses that doesn't affect us, and it's just not true. Uh, there's a high percentage of African Americans with schizophrenia, with major mental illnesses, um, and in particular, what's interesting too is personality disorders. A lot of people may not have familiarity with um, the term of talking about uh, personality disorders, but it's a very pervasive mental health issue that has a, that impacts relationships, including narcissism, including people being histrionic, um, those who are border have borderline personality disorder. But it's not um, other ethnicities; it's uh, uh, it's very pervasive in the African American community. Um, Boris um, Lawrence Henson Foundation. Um, they've lost a COVID, um, launched a COVID-19 free uh, vital, virtual therapy support. So what they're trying to do is get mental health professionals to provide um, low cost or no cost services to those who may need support simply because of COVID-19. Um, Brother, you're on my mind, which is Omega Sci-Fi um, Fraternity Incorporated. Um, they've created um, an online wellness kit. And actually, I was going to share this as a handout because these are all hyperlinks. So you can go to these resources. Ebony's Mental Health Resources by State will help you to reach out and find African American therapists um, in your area. And the next slide, please. Hurdle is another organization as well as Melanin and Mental Health. And then Ourselves Black. All of these organizations here all will help you get connected or even provide resources, information um, about various areas pertaining to mental health and wellness. And I'd encourage all of you who all are at uh, NASA that I am one of the clinicians. And so I provide mental health services um, to NASA Langley and then NASA headquarters. But um, each one of the uh, NASA uh, outlets all have uh, mental health providers that you can access and the services of no cost to you if you are a civil service employee. If in fact you um, are a contractor, then what we can do is help you get connected to a mental health resource um, that with your company. Uh, one of the very interesting things that I heard when I was listening to the astronaut speak is the, is talking about um, self care and mental health wellness in terms of their mission. And I think that's a mission for all of us uh, to access mental health care um, and then also talk about it. Uh, one of the things I did when I was doing my dissertation was part of it was um, looking at the talking cure, like the real benefit in actually talking to one another and connecting with people. Because there really isn't, say, magic in mental health services, but what it is is people um, being able to talk and connect with another person, whether it's a therapist, or talking to a spiritual uh, leader in your community or just simply talking to a good friend. I think um, although formal reaching out for mental health services um, may not have always been a thing within the African-American community, but I do believe that we have, um, we've been reaching out to spiritual leaders, but in particular, having those conversations within barbershops and beauty salons and, you know, just talking of, uh, when we're caring, you know, for one another collectively. I found that a lot of times when people were doing hair, being able to go and talk to someone, but that same talking, you know, has been a, a support, I, I imagine, in our community. I, I found it to be a support. And so I just encourage you all to keep talking, uh, to seek mental wellness, and then reach out if you need support from another person, because uh, mental wellness is an imperative for our community. So that's it. Thank you so much for uh, for listening and allowing me to share with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, at this point in time, we'll continue to a 15 minute uh, Q&A session with our three doctors, Dr. Amgashoff, Dr. Ford, Dr. Taylor, as well as our astronaut Victor Glover. So just give a moment for everyone to come online. And uh, oh, we actually, sorry, we have to adjust the time to eight minutes panel, um, but we will go ahead and get started. Um, so starting with the social determinants of health, uh, one of the questions that we received was that uh, what actions can be taken to improve the impacts 
of social factors on health in the African American community. Um, well, I know that there are more studies being done. Um, like I mentioned, um, I talked about resilience. I know Morehouse and Emory are doing a study on cardiovascular resistance, on um, cardiovascular health and resilience in the African American community. And one of the things that they found was that uh, neighborhoods. Um, that are right next to each other, but one neighborhood ha is higher um, in measures of social cohesion, cohesion um, get, you know, knowing each other, knowing your neighbor, sharing, um, basically everything that Dr. Sills Taylor was talking about, um, actually have more resilience when it comes to cardiovascular health than others. So I think this whole, all of it, as I said, it's social, um, is really taking care of the whole person. I think um, Victor Glover talked about it also. You know, it's your whole community and where you grow. And we really need to start, I believe, with the communities um, and helping them um, stay resilient, as Dr. Sills Taylor was discussing as well. In addition to, um, obviously, eat, if they have the resources, eating right, staying healthy, exercising, all those things. Does, does that help? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question regarding nutrition. So what is what are strategies that can be implemented on a daily basis to improve our nutrition, uh, to include our gut health, our physical health, all of that? Well, I think one of the important things to do, um, you know, as as Victor was saying, is to really is to simplify your life and, you know, and to recognize that, you um, if you're going to be healthy, if your children are going to be healthy, you have to plan. So it does take effort. It takes consistent effort in terms of coming up with grocery lists and doing meal planning and, you know, making certain that we're not always going for the easy thing. You know, I'm a working mom, too, so I know how it is, you know, after work and trying to grab something before piano lessons or whatever. But if you take the time, you know, to make a healthy snack, you know, my kid is into hummus and carrots or just whatever. And and if you if you buy whole foods, they'll have to eat whole foods because that's what's in the house. Don't let them drive your car to the store, right? So, you know, a lot. So it does take, but it is. It's a lot of it's planning. It is planning and it's consistency and it's effort. But like I said, I think the idea is and but make it, you know, make it simple. You don't have to have elaborate meals and snacks in order to be healthy. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, it is difficult sometimes to get a variety of foods or, you know, we've had deliveries, deliveries that were inconsistent. And so I do personally take supplements. I haven't always taken them my whole life, but I take a multivitamin with iron now. I take vitamin D. I take iron, you know, I take zinc. These are things that I've done since the beginning of the pandemic, you know, and I feel well, I've been well. So, you know, ideally we'd like to have this wonderful food supply across the United States, but we don't. And so there may be times when you do have to, you know, you have to take a supplement and and kind of, you know, um, and support yourself in that way. But for now, I think that it makes sense. I do it for myself, I do it for my kids, you know. Um, and so I think that, like I said, to the extent that you wanna dedicate yourself to, right to being well, it, it takes some effort and it takes planning. No, absolutely. That's a great point. And uh, you spoke on the pandemic. So that's actually a great segue uh, to our mental health uh, aspect that we've heard about. So both during the pandemic, as well as in space flight, there's a fair amount of isolation. Uh, so what strategies would you all recommend for maintaining one's uh, mental health while rather in periodic or longer term isolation? I think that we need to find uh, various ways to connect. So um, right now, because of the uh, because of the pandemic um, and we're kind of working separately, there are still ways for us to have some kind of social interaction. I think we're built for connection. I mean, really face to face connection. And so a lot of the therapy work that I do now is telehealth, but um, trying to connect, um, even if it's in small groups, but I think that talking, having conversation, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical, you know, connection, but having Zooms, I mean, having family Zooms. My family actually started having a family Zoom and prayer line. That's something that, that my family is doing. And so just finding some kind of way to connect, um, even via Zoom, is, I think, is effective. 
That's a great point. Um, Mr. Glover, would you like to comment on isolation and mental health maintenance? Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, that it's been mentioned before, I think uh, uh, Sophia just mentioned it, but, you know, we, we're we social primates, you know, for all you biology folks and ecology folks out there, we're social primates, and you cannot get away from that. So in this period where we, you know, we use this term social distancing, and I, I like to say physical distancing, right, we should be socially close still. So using all the different resources uh, that we're probably all too familiar with now, like this one, you know, but also I think about this, you know, for, for example, uh, this Sunday when I go to church, you know, I, I, I'm going to physically go to church, but I'm going to wear my mask and I'm going to keep as much distance as I can just so, you know, in thinking about how we can connect physically, you know, you need to be intentional, like with everything else, like with the eating healthy. You have to shop healthy to eat healthy and you have to set up conditions in your life that allow you to interact in a healthy fashion, given whatever your you know current state of health is. So. My entire family is vaccinated and boosted. And so for us, it's important for us to go to church and do that emotional and spiritual well-being. But we do it safely in masks. We keep our distance. We use hand sanitizers and we're not hugging and, and socializing between the pews as much as we would, uh, you know, outside the pandemic. But it's finding ways to, to do things smartly and thinking about the risks that there are. So and the last thing I'll say, you know, I think most of us are probably already thinking about those things. The last thing I, I want to say about this and I don't know if I mentioned it in the recorded comments, but in this time where there are so many pressures, uh, physical, economic, uh, social, we have to be very good about being concerned about and giving grace to ourselves. We can't give it to anyone else if we cannot give ourselves some grace. So, be, you know, when you hit that point where you say, look, I need to get up from this machine and take a walk, you know, these kids, like, come here, Corinne, come here, come here, come here. Come here, hurry up. When, when you need to walk away from the babies, walk away. When you need to walk away from the computer video screens, walk away. And then take your minute and then come back and get into it. But you need to understand your limits. Knowing your limits actually isn't confining you, it's freeing you. So knowing your limits and then operating within those limits. No one is asking for us to be superhuman in these, in these trying times. We got to know our limits and then operate within them and, and, and give yourself some grace because that helps you understand how to give other people, Grace. Thanks, babe. I just wanted you to say hi real quick. <laughs> no, I completely agree. Those limitations are so important for, for all the aspects of health. And so with just a few minutes left, I'd love for you all, if each of you could just share one tip or something that someone could implement today to either reduce stress, improve their physical health, improve their mental health, just a takeaway to leave us with. That would be great. You want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> go, I'll just I'll just say um, one thing that I um, do is I try to um, to surround myself with with positivity and whether that's having a positive affirmations, um, but finding um, some kind of way to to have positive words around you and positive people. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things that I do um, every day is. Um, I journal every day, every morning. I um, I set a goal for my day in terms of how I want to be in the world, and I make sure that you know um, when I am you know in the office, I'm engaged, I'm talking to people, I'm connecting with people in a real way because that really it really char it charges me, it charges my battery. So when I come to work, I'm on and I enjoy it. So um, I know that we've transitioned. A lot of people are working from home and they like that. But when I'm in the office, I enjoy being in the office. So I think that no matter where you are, you have to make sure that you're engaged every day and that, you know, that you have a plan to be your best that day. And if you fall off, start again the next day. Yeah. And, and I would say it's not, not so much falling off, but I would totally agree with both of what these uh, lovely women said. Um, one is, yeah, give yourself that ability to, you know, think of all the positivity in your life. Make sure you do it at night before you go to bed and reflect back on your day and come up with what there's going to be something that was positive that day and remind yourself that you did that. And I think um, Victor Glover mentioned it earlier. 
one thing, one thing at a time. You know what? Today, um, I really couldn't cook a really great dinner for my kids, but we were able to go out for a brief walk or, or whatever it was, you know, yeah. um, just that one thing that you did and you need to focus on that and really, you know, let yourself be a human. Um, we're not perfect. And then if I can just uh, remind all of us, right, is something I'm constantly trying to practice myself is that we are whole people. We are three dimensional people. We don't get to just be our physical selves, our mental or intellectual selves or our emotional selves. We are all of those things all the time. And so if you can do one thing in each of those dimensions for yourself that that can help you feel better physically going on a walk, you know, you, you, you hear a. Uh, People talk about that emotional, like, you know, you get this wash of positivity. Well, that's actually some chemical things going on. Like, it's physiological. These ladies could explain it better <laughs> than I can. But, you know, there's also a lot of research out there that says one of the healthiest things you can do for your brain, you know, brain health. Neuroscience says moving your body is the best. It's not ginkgo biloba. It's not Sodexo or crossword puzzles. It's physical activity. Uh, but then also... You know, it's it fitness is a, is defined as an, an organism's ability to respond to its environment. It isn't you know posing on the beach in big muscles. But if you think about being fit mentally, physically, and spiritually and emotionally, it's doing one simple thing over a long period of time. It's not this new diet for two weeks or this new workout machine or reading that one book by that great, I mean, it's a great book if you wanna read it, but that one book isn't gonna make a difference. But if you have healthy habits that feed you intellectually, that feed you emotionally and spiritually, and that are feeding you and helping you physically, little things over a long period of time are gonna help that whole person wellness. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Those are excellent takeaways, Dr. Oma. Um, Gishoff, Dr. Ford, Dr. Taylor, astronaut Glover, thank you so much for participating. I'm now going to kick it over to Steve Shee, the NASA Associate Administrator for Diversity, Equity, and Opportunity, in inclusion for a few closing remarks. Thanks, everyone. My goodness, what a wonderful program this has been. The speakers have been just so informative and inspiring. Uh, I'm personally just energized and uplifted by this program. You know, Black History Month is such an important annual observance. It provides us an opportunity to preserve and expand our awareness of African-American history. And this includes to understand the severe discrimination, the violence and the injustices that African-Americans have suffered. And it also gives us an opportunity to celebrate the extraordinary and inspiring resilience, the achievements and the societal contributions that African-Americans have also accomplished. This annual observance gives us an opportunity to further reinforce our commitment to an even better future with advanced diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, DEIA. And even in times of great societal unrest, and we've had such challenging times recently, I remain so optimistic about our future. Our administrator and deputy administrator, in fact, our entire senior leadership team is placing such a tremendous priority on DEIA. In fact, the administrator held his first executive council meeting of the year yesterday. And I'm happy to report to you that the one topic for the entire two hours of the meeting was DEIA. Pretty awesome. I'm also optimistic because my children have grown up in a generation I believe is better informed about and committed to DEIA. And I believe this is a generation that is also much more accustomed to inclusiveness and diversity. I know this isn't true everywhere across our country and we have a lot more progress to make. Um, my eyes were really opened up in recent years about how much more progress we need to make. But I really sincerely believe this generation is more advanced. My kids and the kids in the communities near where I live all spend time together in groups and groups composed of different friends. They're particularly connected to the diversity of friends because they're always on their cell phones and social media. And in fact, they're in groups so much that they even date in groups. <laughs> they don't even do one-on-one -on -one dating. I coached youth, youth sports for 20 years, including AAU basketball. And I've seen kids from different places and of different backgrounds come together in AAU and other leagues. Um, and they play and they compete together and they, they establish friendships and they stay in touch. And it's all free of racial and other biases. So I know this generation will grow up to advance and demand an even more inclusive, accessible and equitable world for diversity of people. I love the theme of our special observance this year, black health and wellness because the approach we're taking at NASA on DEIA includes a strategic focus on connection to our agency's missions, 
as well as connection of our people to each other. And this is all to empower the health and wellness of our missions and our workforce. And this focus on connection to mission and people is in turn critical for the overall health and wellness of individuals. In fact, I'd like to tell you about a pair of longitudinal studies really quickly by Harvard Medical School that has been ongoing for over 80 years. If you know anything about long longitudinal studies, you'll know this is phenomenal because um, most longitudinal studies, they end uh, because they run out of funding or the researchers or the subjects die. This study is in its second generation of people. And the studies are known as the Grant and Gluck studies. They've identified the single biggest factors to health, longevity, and wellness. And what do you think they are? They're everything that astronaut Glover and our doctors spoke about today. These studies have found that the single biggest causal factor for health and longevity is the quality of social networks. And the biggest causal factor for mental wellness is purpose. These studies reinforce the importance of DEIA, the importance of people connecting with and taking care of each other while working together towards a higher common purpose. So our astronauts, including Victor and Dr. Emgeshoff, Dr. Sills Taylor, and Dr. Forrest spoke to the critical importance of social connection, talking and knowing, checking on and taking care of others, making sure that Victor is smiling and eating uh, so he can stay that healthy and well Ike, and the importance of our communities, including our gathering spots, like the communal barbershops. So our program today is so appropriate and spot on in connecting health and wellness to DEIA through Black History Month. I'd like to thank NASA's African-American Employee Resource Group Collaboration Team and all of our African-American ERGs across the agency for putting, putting together and hosting this event today and for all you do to support and advance DEIA and to take care of the health and wellness of all of us. I'm so grateful for each of you today participating in this program and I hope you enjoyed this program. I also hope you'll focus on your health and wellness and continue contributing to our agency's collective DEI efforts to empower the health and wellness of our agency and everyone. Thank you so much. NASA celebrates Black History Month.